So our next speaker is Caitlin Kostelik. Uh, she is a physical therapist with us at UCSF Sports Medicine Center for Young Athletes. Uh, she has a special interest in working with young dancers, gymnasts, cheerleaders, and swimmers. She leads our dance medicine program at the UCSF Sports Medicine Center for Young Athletes, which focuses on treating and preventing common dance and gymnastic injuries. She completed her doctor of physical therapy at the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences. She's a certified specialist in manual therapy techniques, which include myofascial release, mobilization, and manipulation. She's also a birds board certified specialist in sports through the American Physical Therapy Association. So welcome, Caitlin. Good morning. My heart's racing. Okay. So I have a lot of slides, so we're going to go through a few a little quickly, and then we will progress to kind of get to the meat of it. So we're going to talk about return to impact after back injuries, specifically in gymnastics. I have no disclosures. See my course description and my course objectives. We are specifically going to be talking about artistic gymnastics. <clears throat> so for women's artistic gymnastics, um, women have four different apparatuses that they are going to be performing on. Floor, uneven bars, vault, and the balance beam. And then for men, they have six. So floor, parallel bars, pommel horse, rings, vault, and a high bar. For injury rates and preclusion, specifically female athletes, which has the most research out there, is that it can be divided into four groups. You have novice, intermediate, high level, and elite. So the higher up you go, specifically elite, you're gonna have more hours that you're gonna be participating in practice, 20 plus hours. So then the higher level you are, the more injuries that you're going to be getting. For location and type of injuries, low back injuries is going to be 11 to 17%. So it's the seven or second most common um, after ankle and foot. And then you also have knee, wrist, and hand. For back pain, you have female and male artistic gymnastics. 65 to 85% are going to have back pain. Now, that level is going to depend on the age their level that they're actually at, which means like the skills that they're actually participating in. Some of those injuries are gonna be muscle strains, and then you're gonna also have um, disc injuries and spondylolysis. So spondylolysis we're gonna talk more in depth about, but that's gonna be 11% of female gymnasts with the fifth lumbar vertebra being the most common. General causes of back pain for our gymnasts is gonna be a hyperlordotic posture. Muscle imbalances, because of that, Decreased range of motion for shoulder, wrist, and hip extension, which we're going to talk about extensively in a few slides. Repetitive movements and activities, and then an increase in the ground reaction force during landing, specifically during tumbling and dismounts. So for ground reaction forces, it's going to have a big impact on disc and muscle strains, when, especially because they're going to be landing in a forward flex position. So a study in 2012 that I found that 30% of gymnasts who landed in what they call the back sole, but basically like a back flip or a back tuck with their lower lumbar spine is going to be flexed beyond their active end range, is going to experience a ground reaction force of 6.8 to 13.3 times their body weight during that landing. So because of that, um, there is evidence that adopting that end range sagittal spinal position results in a reduced activity of the lumbar spine stabilizing muscles, which is going to be associated with poor back muscle endurance and then an increased risk of injury, specifically the load on the disc and then um, muscle strains. So that's for flexion. And then extension base is going to be spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis. So spondylolysis is going to be that stress fracture of the pars interarticulares, which is the bony connection between the superior and inferior articular facets, and spondylolisthesis, which is where you're going to get that forward slippage. And it's most common in children and young adults, specifically between children five and eight, and a lot of young gymnasts end up starting somewhere around two or three, sometimes five or eight, and it's going to affect about 5% of that population. For gymnastics specifically, for spondylolysis, it's usually caused by hyperextension um, against the ground when coming off of an apparatus and a torsion motion during those exercises, so like a twisting, which leads to an increase in shear forces. As those shear forces increase, you're gonna increase pressure on the facet joint, 
And then those forces are then transmitted to the pars intraarticulares. And since it's so small, it can't absorb the shock, which leads to a stress fracture. Our patient presentation when they come into the clinic, it's usually an insidious onset, low back pain, which is usually worsened with hyperextension. And it's gonna typically occur with those hyperlordotic females that are gonna have hypermobility in their lumbar spine, usually a thoracic kyphosis and hypomobility, decreased shoulder flexion because of that thoracic kyphosis, and limited hip extension because of their um, anterior pelvic tilt tight hip flexors to tight quads with poor TVA core control and pelvic strength, usually due to recent changes in activity, um, increased level of skills or increased level of hours that they're participating in their sports. So we've developed a return to gymnastics impact checklist. So here's all the things that I'm going to be looking at in the clinic to allow my patient to go back to impact. And then we're going to break this down more specifically. So for range of motion, I want full shoulder, wrist, elbow, hip extension. And we can also use an overhead mobility screen, which we're going to talk about, which is quick and easy in the clinic for um, MDs as well as our PTs. Thoracic and lumbar extension range of motion. And we want it to be symptom free with no hinging or hip thrust compensation. Strength, we're going to look at scapular, serratus anterior or posterior chain. Abdominals, I like a lower leg test and a front and side plank for endurance. And then on the right hand side, I have the average angle for the uh, double leg lower test that they should be able to achieve. So the lower they can go, the stronger their abdominals are. And then back extensors, the Beersing Sorsen test. For research, all I could find was more ages 19 to 29. That was the youngest. But basically, males and females need to hold this extended position for two plus minutes. Function an upper extremity closed kinetic chain test, and then a return to sports skill progression, which we're gonna talk about. So how do we get there? How do we get to that checklist? So a lot of information for my evaluation, but we're gonna be looking at their standing posture and how they just present, looking from front, side, and back. Active range of motion from lumbar and thoracic spine to shoulder flexion, elbow extension, wrist extension, hip mobility, joint mobility in their thoracic and lumbar spine. And then we look at muscle length from Thomas test, looking at hip flexors, iliotibial band, quadriceps, hamstrings in 1990. Most of these gymnasts are gonna have about 130 degrees of a straight leg raise or that hamstring length in order to achieve their long extensions. And then lat and pectoral length for overhead flexion. Strength, posterior chain, the double leg lower test, Back extensor strength, if you're able to get into that extensor position, sometimes in evaluation, they're too painful and you have to defer it to later. Scapular strength and then serratus anterior. For lumbar and thoracic range of motion, we like using an inclinometer. So you can use a bubble inclinometer or a digital. And so for the bubble inclinometer, you need two of them. And for lumbar spine, you're going to put a bubble inclinometer on T12L1 and then one on the sacrum. You're then going to have them perform forward flexion and extension. And then you're going to <clears throat> subtract the bottom inclinometer number from the top in order to get your range of motion in that area. And then I like to repeat it in the thoracic spine from C7T1 to T12L1. And then I put the norms for ranges for lumbar and thoracic range of motion. That way you can then track it for uh, when they're going towards discharge. So I've mentioned a lot about shoulder, wrist, and hip. Well, my patient's here for their back. Why am I looking at all these things? And that's because the extremities and back have a significant relationship, specifically with gymnasts. So our upper extremity range requirements for getting somebody back to tumbling is that their shoulder flexion and abduction needs to be at least 180 degrees. If the patient doesn't have this adequate shoulder flexion or wrist extension, then they're gonna compensate. And usually that compensation comes from the lumbar spine, usually around the L4-S1, and sometimes around that thoracolumbar junction. For elbows, we want full extension, or the patient might go into hyperextension because of their hypermobility. So we try to make sure that they're able to hyperextend equally on both sides, or at least that they're to zero. And then wrist extension is gonna be very important. We want active range of motion of 90, which is a lot of active range. Passive, they need to be able to go beyond 90 degrees. And that's because when they are doing something backwards, so like a 
um, back tuck or where they're punching um, off, basically after like a round off. If they don't have that adequate wrist extension, then they're going to compensate as well. So in the picture, this young girl doesn't have adequate shoulder flexion. So her shoulders should be at her ears and then her wrists don't have proper extension. So because of that, in order to maintain this upright position, she's going to hyperextend her low back, which can cause injury. The same is gonna be true for the lump, for the uh, lower extremities for the hip extension. So proper hip, hip extension is gonna be 10 degrees. If they have limited range of motion because of tightness in their hip flexors, then they're gonna be in this increased lumbar lordosis, which is gonna put extra strain on their lumbar spine. And so if they don't also have that adequate hip extension, being already in extended position, they're not gonna have any room to extend beyond that. Shoulder muscles that are gonna be important for tumbling is, um, is also gonna be really important and some that we might not typically think of. So most gymnasts have scapular protraction because of overuse of their lats, teres major, and pectoral major minors. And so they're gonna be in that protracted position and the scapular muscles for retraction aren't gonna be very strong. So we really need to work on middle and low traps. We also have to work on serratus anterior. Serratus anterior and the traps are gonna to work together to help stabilize the scapula for upward rotation. And if you don't have proper strength then your shoulders are gonna collapse and you're not gonna have the inability to what's called block or push off the floor or the vault. And so you have to really make sure that serratus is strong as well. I use an overhead mobility screen quickly if I don't have time during my evaluation. And this is really easy to do um, in the clinic. And you can either do it visually, which is this photo. So you're gonna have the patient stand, tell them to raise their arms up overhead and lean backwards. You don't wanna give them any cues, just see how they move. Repeat a few times and look from each direction. So you should see a slight weight shift forward, using their hips to extend, counterbalancing with their center of mass, smooth thoracic spine extension. Their arms should be back behind their ears. You don't want them to hyper extend their low back, have a rib flare or forehead motion. And you shouldn't see the hips staying forward and all of their motion coming from the lumbar spine in a hinging motion. Once I do that, then I'll have the patient go to a wall and I have them sit crisscross applesauce with their hips, their back and their head against the wall. And what they're gonna do is just raise their arms overhead. So the first is gonna be an internally rotated position. They need this position for bar and tumbling. From here, then I can see any compensations and I can make sure that their head and back are completely flat against the wall. I can then take a goniometer and measure shoulder flexion. The other option is I can use a measuring tape from the ulnar styloid to the wall to see some limitations. Also having them um, in an externally rotated position, that's gonna be for bar as well. We have a parallel in our clinic, but if you don't, you don't need to use one, but it's really nice for them to be able to hold and grasp onto a parallel bar in order to do the motion for you because it kind of mimics when they're on the bar. And then you have to look in a closed grip position for beam. And I do the same thing, sit against the wall, lift your arms up overhand, and then I take measurements. I do this a lot for actually swimmers as well, um, or any of my upper extremity athletes, because it's just something that can be quick and fast for a fast measurement. And then some compensations are that rib flare I mentioned, a Y position or forward head. And then exercises and stretches and manual therapy that we can do to get these athletes back to sport. So for manual therapy, there's a lot of areas that we, we look at. We're gonna look at our lumbar spine for our paraspinals and QL. If they're tight, it's gonna limit our forward flexion, side bending and rotation. We use a lot of myofascial decompression as well as instrument assisted soft tissue massage. Hip flexor released, improve our hip extension quadriceps again for hip extension. And then even though they're here for the back, I also look at their calf length because you need to have adequate dorsiflexion for tumbling, lats and scaps for overhead flexion, and then forearm flexors for that wrist extension. And then we do thoracic mobilizations in order to increase extension because they're usually hypomobile in the thoracic spine. 
where we can be doing thoracic gl uh, PA glides, foam rolling, and then we have them do exercises on the foam rollers, such as snow angels or toy soldiers, and an open book to work on rotation. So here's some of the manual um, home exercise program that I give patients. And a lot of it, again, is with the foam roller, foam rolling the lats, doing an open book for rotation, and then hip flexor stretch, making sure with their hip flexor stretch, they're tucking their tailbone or doing a posterior pelvic tilt. That way we are not increasing the extension of the lumbar spine and we're really focusing on the hip flexor. I like using a lacrosse ball because it's something they can take with them to gym and they're about a dollar. Um, you can use a tennis ball as well, except for it has a little bit more give to it. And so it's gonna be a little bit more compressive, but getting into their pecs and their lats, the top one is a lat stretch. Again, we have a parallel, but you don't need it. And maintaining a forward flex position in a kneeling position with their elbows on a box, or they can do it at home on their bed or on a couch, and then lowering themselves down to get a stretch on their lats. For stabilization, we, we focus a lot in the beginning on a neutral spine compared to being in a anterior or posterior pelvic tilt. For some patients, talking about a pelvic bowl is really helpful. For others, I, I talk to them about a pelvic clock, so belly button and their pubic bone, so 12 and 6 o'clock, maintaining um, the same plane of motion when we're doing exercises. So we start in supine for stabilization, focusing mainly on TVA activation, moving from just a TA, TVA palpation to leg extensions, leg fallouts, um, lower extremity ex extensions, dying bugs, and then moving up into V-ups or a hollowed position for them. Moving out of supine, we can go into quadruped, tall kneeling, half kneeling, and work on rhythmic stabilization. For that, you can add dowels or you can add therabands like the picture um, on your right hand side. So maintaining, again, that neutral spine position and then it coming up into either flexion or extension with a theraband, moving their arms up and down to work um, posterior chain and lats. We also like Pavlov press, bird dogs. Again, you can either do rhythmic stabilization or add it into an anti-rotational, anti-flexion, anti-extension, anti-side bending exercises because these athletes need stability in every single plane. For lower extremities, if you're able to add in proximal hip with an arm exercise or a core exercise. We like that as well from super clamps to bridges with some lat work. And then they also have to be able to re-strengthen those hip flexors. So if you've already done a hip flexor release, you then have to re-strengthen it because they need that to bring their legs up if they're going to be um, tumbling or on bars. And so being able to hold a really great TVA contraction while lifting their leg up and doing a hovering position, either in a forward position or in back, and I'll usually have them do an isometric or leg lifts up and down. Scapula, again, doing things in different positions from sitting to half kneel to tall kneel, from rows to lap pull downs, as well as T's, W's, I's, Y position for lower trap. And then getting that latissimus dorsi strength as well once we've loosened it up. Um, this is a overhead control working a little bit eccentrically. So we like to put a TheraBand around the patient's wrist. They're gonna do bilateral shoulder external rotation while bringing their arms up overhead, maintaining that flat back neutral spine position without their back arching. And serratus anterior, you can do in quadruped, having them kneel on furniture sliders and then doing a protracted position, moving backwards. And then you can make it harder by then having them go into a full plank position as well, maintaining their scapula on their ribs. Advanced strengthening, still in that neutral spine position from med ball slams to deadlifts, squats, starting to work on some plyometrics, um, double leg and single leg jumping, working on posterior hip hinge for landing for dismounts. And then some single leg bridges, you could do head on a ball, working that end range hip extension for plyo. And then finally working into extension. So we start working into extension once they've maintained that full active range of motion, but it's also really dependent on the patient's symptoms. So if they have pain, we don't progress into extension yet. We can start with some easier ones like a prone swimmer or Superman, and then I progress them over a ball if able.
going into a bridge and then a bridge with their leg up. For our gymnasts with their bridges, we wanna make sure that their shoulders and wrists are gonna be right, their wrists are right underneath their shoulders and that they're getting their extension throughout their full thoracic and lumbar spine and they're not hinging at their TL junction or lower lumbar. And then our return to impact skills is once I feel like the patient in the clinic has been able to do some extension, then we can move to doing things at gymnastics. And so going from left to right is gonna be um, a tumble track, an air track, a tumble track, which is also called a rod floor, and then the spring floor that they're gonna be competing on. The tumble track is gonna be more bouncy, so it's more like a trampoline. So it's gonna have a little bit more spring to it and will decrease the load for their landing. Moving on to a air track or an air mat. Some patients will have these at home in their backyards um, or in their house. And then a rod floor, which isn't quite as common for a lot of the places around here. And then the spring floor. So the spring floor is gonna be made up of a spring. And then you have plywood, a soft mat, and then the carpet. So I'll have the work from left to right, dependent on what is at their gym. For a lot of places, they have the tumble track, the trampoline, and the spring floor. And then I wrote out a return to impact for, for people to kind of follow a little bit if they're working with patients on what to do, especially if it's not your area of expertise. So can begin skills that don't involve extension sooner, like choreography, um, forward flexion activities, and then moving into extension. And then it's okay to practice dismounts into a pit if we don't want them to be doing a hard landing. And they can do that from the tumble track as well. So going from bars to beam, um, tumbling vault. So I gave kind of a progression. And that's it. <laughs> that's a lot.